Good morning. In the last few weeks, we've been looking at a few different things, specifically involving the days after Jesus' resurrection. Um, in all my years in the church, not a lot of time was ever devoted into that period of time. It was 40 days he spent here on earth and then 10 additional days leading up into Pentecost. And I honestly had never studied it a lot of myself. The title of the series is Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth, which of course spells out B-I-B-L-E. As we come into graduation season, like I kind of said, we start to begin to focus on have we given our children everything that they need to know. For the first time, they will be out from under your home. They will not always be underneath your thumb, under your watchful eye. We need to know if they really know everything that they need to know, not just the things of God, which are the most important, but the things, the practical things in life. Like these new grads, we must, too, also as Christians, always remember that we are being sent out into a new world just as they are. We may have been Christians 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, but every day when you walk out, you're going to encounter people that you never met before. There's going to be a new exposure to things, even at our age, just like it is for the 18 and 19-year-olds. Your mission field develops every day. Every year, you're, a lot of you aren't doing the same things this year that you did last year. So the mix of people that you're around are different. The exposure that you have is different. We never outgrow that. We should never want to outgrow that newness. Those of us who went off to college, we remember the first day we showed up on campus. You know, it just, you always had, you were just uncertain. Well, we should walk out into every day with that. That's certain, that uncertainty, as we look back on it, it's a positive thing. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20. This is speaking whenever the, the, the apostles are with Christ after his resurrection. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This command, we as those who grew up in the church recognize as the Great Commission. I've said it before that they did a survey and half of all people in churches today had no idea what the Great Commission was when they asked them in church. They had no idea what the Great Commission was. The church universal has lost the desire to go out and create other Christians. The greatest part of the commandment and the Great Commission is simply go. G-O. I used to tell everybody that was my favorite two letters in the alphabet. G-O. I love to go. I, I love to go. We're, we're trying to move into a point in our lives now where we can get rid of everything, sell what we have, you know, and just begin to travel and go and do the things we weren't able to do. We as Christians should have that same desire. Whenever Paul was sitting in under when he was a prisoner writing the epistles, which I'm glad that he wrote all these books that he did, but he always had the desire to go, to go, to go, to spread the word of God, to see something new, to see something different. You get a chance to travel and see the world, but you're also getting a chance to meet people there that have never heard of Christ. So many speakers, whenever we go to these commencement exercises, you know, we, you, know you go to them, and you remember you sat through your own, you know, sometimes there's been some really good ones and some really bad ones. But almost all of the commencement exercises have the same thing. They have the same, beyond around the word, go. They told them some basic information that they needed to know. They told them to go. They told them to find their passion. They tell them to work hard, study hard, have a good time, but balance it out. They begin to give practical lessons. I like Judge Billy Bennett the other night at Grace's own graduation. One of, his one of his particular points of advice, he said, is you will get in the mail an envelope telling me you have been pre-approved for a credit card. He said, throw that in the trash. <laughs> they might not remember anything else from the whole speech, but hopefully they remember that. I remember, I started college at, like, like Billy Bennett. He started at 16, so did I. And I remember getting an American Express pre-approved what is a 16-year-old. That was insane. Absolutely insane. More insane part was I filled it out and sent it back in. But that's another story. No one told me in my graduation I was supposed to throw it away. I was very impressed with myself. We as disciples, just like the 11 that stood before Christ on that day, we have a job. We have a task. He's told us the same thing. He said, go. Remember, we are disciples. Everyone in this building is a disciple. Disciple is simply a Latin word. 
Disciplinus, which means a learner. Everyone in this room, if you are willing to learn, is a learner, which means you are also dis a disciple. Just by the simple fact that I'm only a teacher if you learn. Everyone's a teacher and knows that. You're not, if they're not learning, you're not teaching. It's not that it's your fault, but nothing is if no one's been taught. Here you stand. The command to us is the same as Jesus that he gave to the eleven on that day. Therefore, go. You got to go. Make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Go, make disciples, baptize, teach them. But the most important is go. That's the hardest part. Jesus knew that. He knew that was going to be the hardest part for them to go. Some of you may have noticed, and a few people have noticed, in the back of my, my truck is a bicycle. And I've told them my, my bicycle wrecks, so I might see that again. But the main thing for me to be able to get fit again, and mine was my cardiac, my, heart, my resting heart rate was too high. I needed to find something that I could go, go to do to lower my rate. The hardest part, though, was the go. I had a rowing machine on the back porch. I got treadmills. I had a bike already. You know, but it's the get out and go part that I was lacking on. I know how to witness to people. I know what they need to be told, but it's the go part of it. I get up and I drive 45, I get up at 3.45 to 4 a.m. and I drive 45 minutes to Alexandria and get with a group of guys and girls that ride and we're there as a group. And, and I, we know if one's not there because they will give you the worst amount of time on the next time if you miss a class. They're all over you. But they have that. I have to have that around me. And Jesus knew that about us. The disciples were all sent out, what? Two by two, we used to sing a little song. They had 11, 12 disciples. We're meant to go as a group. We know how much better we are if we go and involve ourselves in group activities. That's what he knew we were going to need help with. But he knew we needed something else. There's got to be a spark. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Once, when Jesus was eating with the disciples, again, this is after his resurrection, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, a little farther down, he says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and all of Samaria, and even into the ends of the earth. Jesus knew that being his witness would be hard, but he knew that his Father promised to send everyone who committed to witness a helper, a comforter, the Holy Spirit. That's a promise to us. Through Jesus, they had seen the Father. Remember, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And now, with the Holy Spirit coming upon them, they were able to experience and know firsthand the entire Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How many of you ever tried to sit on a one-legged stool? How many of you ever tried to sit on a two-legged stool? But a three-legged stool, I can manage that. It's the same way with the foundation. If we have the fullness of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 49. Then Jesus said, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message will be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things, he told them. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. He told him, he says, it is written that this message will be proclaimed. What is the message? What is the message that he said is your job to proclaim to all the world? It was very simple. There is forgiveness of sin for all 
who repent. You say, I don't know how to witness. I don't know how to go talk to people. It's not hard. You know what? They're having a bad life and you know that they're going through things that they shouldn't be going through. And you know what? I got hope for you. There is forgiveness of sin for all of those who repent. And who are we to teach this to? Who did he tell us we're to teach this to? All the world. All the nations. Beginning where? In Jerusalem. When Jesus was talking to the disciples, where were they at? It's not hard. I just told you. Where were they at? They were in Jerusalem. Very good. So I'm going to ask you this morning. Where are you at this morning? You're in Marksville, for those who weren't quite sure. You were in Marksville. So where should you start? Marksville. And what should you proclaim? There is forgiveness of sin for all who repent. Luke chapter 24, verse 39. We'll read it again. Jesus told him, Now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. He said, look, stay here for a couple of weeks. God's going to send you a helper. They didn't fully understand what that meant. They'd been told over and over, but they didn't understand exactly what it meant. He had told them all of these things before he died. This is not the first time they had heard them. But yet they heard, but they did not believe. Like we said about kids, they, they listen, but they don't hear. Jesus had told them years before in John 14, 15, If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, an encourager, a counselor, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truths. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the Comforter, the Holy Spirit as my representative, that Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and peace of heart. And the peace I give is a gift as the world cannot give. So don't be troubled and don't be afraid. Can you imagine what he's given us? He's given us this amazing thing that we have to do, but he says, don't worry. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. I'm sending you someone. Another point in the scripture, Jesus said, I have to leave here. I have to go so that the Spirit can come. In his mind, the Spirit coming and filled us was able to do so much more than he as one God man could do here on earth. He said, the Spirit has come to give you all of these things that you need to know that you can do. What was the gift Jesus and the Father gave us? He gave us peace. He gave us comfort. He brought us the Holy Spirit. How many of you in here got the little envelopes from all the graduates around the community? Some of you had to say, who is this? But everybody got them. It's all right. You got them. You ain't heard from them in forever. Especially, I imagine, if you were a teacher and you taught them, you know, some of them you may have taught 14, 15 years ago. I mean, not every night I've promised 12 years. So, no, I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about how long some of them stayed in school to make it to that point. But you're going to get there. And what's expected when you receive an, an invitation? It's not an invitation to attend. You only get four or five tickets. And the anticipation is that there will be a gift to be sent, right? So what kind of gifts do you give? You know what? Those of us who know when we went to school, we give the gifts. We give the things that we know that they're going to need, right? Because we know what lies ahead. Most oftentimes, you give them money because you know they're going to need it without a doubt. You know that even if they don't think they're going to need it, they're going to need it. Even if they don't, it'll be a comfort to them to know if something happens, I've got some money set aside. We're going to be all right. How many of you, when your kids ask to go out to the store, are going to be going for somewhere, you ask them, what, you need some money? Every now and then they'll say, no, I don't need it. I don't need any money. I'm, I don't need any money. I'm going to say that. I'm like, look, no, here, take some money. It's not for them. It's for you as a comfort to know, okay, they say they don't need any money. They might have $2. I'm going to give them some money. It's a comfort unto you, which is the same thing in John 14, 26. But when the Father sends a comforter as my representative, 
That is the Holy Spirit. He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. He will teach you everything. But most important, he will remind you of everything that I have taught you. The comforter sent to comfort us also is a comfort unto God the Father and God the Spirit because he knows it will be all right if we have the Holy Spirit within us. It's a comfort to God the Father, comfort to God the Son, and everything that they taught us, it's all right. We'll be all right. We'll be all right. We know, we, we know they have what they need. When we send our kids off to college, we want to know, you know, right, they'll make the right decisions. I gave them what they needed. They will be reminded of the things that I taught them. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit does for us. We're coming up in two weeks on Pentecost Sunday. This is the day that Jesus told his disciples, go wait. Uh, King James says, go and tarry in Jerusalem until the comforter comes. This is what he told them to go wait for. The disciples, the learners. He said, go and wait. He had told us them before in John 16, 7. He said, in fact, it's best for you that I go away because if I don't, the comfort of the Holy Spirit won't come. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. We have been called to do one thing. What did I say we've been called to do? Go. We have been called to go. To go to make disciples. You know what? The Holy Spirit does most of the work. He said the Holy Spirit will do what? Convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The Holy Spirit does all the work. We just simply go in and make the introduction and speak to them. Can you imagine if you're a door-to-door -door salesman? I love to read about people that were door-to-door -door salesmen. Johnny Carson was a door-to-door -door salesman, a vacuum cleaner salesman. And you can just imagine you know, that, that charisma that he would have had. You know, of course, I'd have bought him. I had two already. I'd have bought you know, from Johnny Carson. You know, he wasn't Johnny Carson at the time, but he had that charisma about him. But it's the ones that I like that go to the door and the, the, the product is so amazing that what? It sells itself. It doesn't take any kind of sales, but the product just sells itself. You know what? When you begin to witness and give people God's word, you know what? The product sells itself. There is nothing great about true evangelists. The evangelists, I'm not talking about TV evangelists. I'm not talking about preachers standing here in the pulpit. I'm talking about evangelists, people who go out and spread the good news. You know someone who can't do anything but in a situation to talk about God and about Christ. No matter what the situation, you may get work, they're going to come up and they're going to tell you, they're going to spread the good news. Those are the greatest evangelists because they know they have a product that sells itself. That's exactly how we should be. The Spirit and the Word of God convict the man. We are just the messengers. Like the disciples, we need to tarry here and pray. Even fast. Do you know fasting still exists within the church? Prayer, fasting, tarrying, waiting, meditating. All of these things are important. That we can seek God to send His Holy Spirit here to fill us, to fill this church. These disciples, us as learners, this is the only way that the Great Commission can be fulfilled. We can't even begin to fulfill the mission statement of the United Methodist Church. We're in a Methodist church. The mission statement says the mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's the only reason we're here, to make additional disciples. That is the only reason we're here, and we must go. And the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to give us the strength to be able to do that. But we must seek that the Holy Spirit will fill this congregation, fill this church, so that the whole world can be spread and touched starting right here. It can start in this little church. I have no doubt in my mind that it can spread. And then we can receive a promise unto us. Acts chapter 13 verse 52 says, The disciples were continuously filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Everyone in here is a disciple. We're all learners. Wouldn't you like to be continuously filled with joy? Do you know someone maybe in this church who's not continuously filled with joy and you would pray that they would be continuously filled with joy and don't make eye contact with them? It could be a mirror. I should probably look at myself. I would love to be continuously filled with joy. I love a church that's continuously filled with joy and that only comes through the Holy Spirit.
I'm going to ask you as a challenge in these next two weeks that you'll stand with me, that you will pray, that you will tarry, that you will meditate, that you will fast, that come Pentecost Sunday, we see such a renewal upon this body. The ones that were here, pray them back. Get them in here. We're going to need the help because I want us to be able to, as a church, to reach out into this community. I want us to exist to be able to expand and benefit the community. I think the church needs to be a lighthouse again. The church needs to be the source. The politicians aren't going to do it. The House and the Senate isn't going to do it. It's going to be the home and the church. That's the only opportunities we have. Go door to door. Don't vote for me. I'm here for Jesus. I promise you. I'm not running for clerk or court. I'm not running for anything. I'm here to spread the good news about Jesus. The Spirit will do that for us. We'll go into the community and make disciples. I need this church to be a church of action. I need this church to be a church of verbs, not just nouns. Action verbs would be very great. We need to run, go. We will go and we will find them. We will teach them. We'll bring them here. We will attempt also to meet not just their spiritual needs, but their physical needs. When the altar is open, I want you to come and ask God to send his spirit upon us and specifically to come and send his spirit in fullness upon you so that we can go out into Marksville, Louisiana, the United States, and the world, creating disciples everywhere we go. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity for us to hear your word. I pray, Lord God, even now that your Holy Spirit will come upon us and fill us, giving us a new power to embolden us, Lord God, to be able to spread your word. I pray, Father God, that we will go forth and make new disciples for no intention of any other, Lord God, but to expand your kingdom. I pray for all of those here in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.